kind of pass certain hurdles before you know they cross their fingers and get their whole life on it. Because wishful thinking is the enemy of all your business. And the second question I asked them is, what do you do in the first five years not to die? I mean, you, you're su always surprised about these great vision entrepreneurs. It typically is that they're really, really, really good at operating businesses. They can do it in their sleep. They're so good at it. Because then they can spend all their time building, right? And so I went out and talked to a bunch of people, right? A bunch of friends and, and uh, collaborators and founders of PayPal, AOL, Elon Musk and Tesla, Tesla uh, Mark uh, Echo, Sarah Blake and Spanx, founders of Ted and Honest T and iRobot. And, so half the group are, are billionaires, and it's a phenomenal group of people, and, and uh, I learned a lot, okay? And that's all in the book, and I don't really gain the economics of that, but just if you want to read it, it's a phenomenal story. But I bet you want to know, like, just tell me, this is the dramatic moment, uh, just tell me the secrets. Does it actually work? You know this upside down. Okay, Here, just tell me the secrets. Just give me the summary of what you learned, which I'm about to do. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry. Oh, these are the blurbs. A lot of people thought it was great. So, actually, um, this, this one was like humble brag moments. I had something awesome happen yesterday. So, Jeff Nimmel, the CEO of GE, wrote his 2012 annual shareholder letter yesterday and released it. And he said at the end of his long letter, which was, he, he's been influenced the most by two books in the last. Well, months, which one of them? What was the lead startup? What was the startup label? So I was very humbled by that. And now he's a, a friend, so I was very thankful he built that one. Um, and so what I do right now is I just want to tell you the five things that we learned in this entire journey. Because you want to know the answers. You want to know the lenses, right? What's common across all of these people, right, that you yourself can install in your mind so you can look at your idea with a new sense of urgency, a new sense of focus? How are we doing? Are we good? Okay, I'm just going like, to like, let's go. Okay. okay, next slide. Um, so just really briefly, I always like to promote my three little kids. This is uh, Jack, Steven, and Lucas, 257, my, my boys. We've had, we've had three or four exits from 10 to 50 to 250 to zero, had failure, had who knows what's going to happen to the outcomes. We keep going, they're going to bank with me, so they get right to the, uh, to the summit. Next. <laughs> next. <laughs> next. <laughs> next. Okay, next. Okay. So here, I'm just getting to the point. So, next slide. None of these questions said for you to go more, right? Yes. All right, back up. Now I go too far. Okay, so, here it is. So, the first thing is, <laughs> next slide, <laughs> across all of the key learning was that it, all of you had a profound sense of identity. They had incredible self awareness and knowledge of like what they were gifted at and what they were not. And what they did in this process is they quit the things that they were bad at. If they weren't good at you know, surfing their skill, they would not pursue that, right? They, if they weren't good at music, they wouldn't fall in music. If you were good at engineering, they would go uh, with engineering. Um, they knew themselves so well that they either surround surrounded a place where they're weakness or they just didn't focus on that. And so what I was describing is, is that they focused on what they were innately good at, okay? And so the first question, and they're smart, right? Most people are really gifted, okay? So the question really about your own startup is, what is your innate gift? Does the company really reflect an innate special part of you that flows from you to the company the marketplace? If you're just chasing white space, you're in a lot of trouble. Because what will happen is you'll get you'll find yourself in a marketplace where you're actually um, losing to someone whose innate gift was to form that company. And so you can't violate that truth. You can't ask the question of how big will this be and start bolting on you know, beliefs and and components to your business to end up in a big space that you aren't innately gifted to. You just have to follow the rabbit hole and focus on how big can the purpose of this be. Number two is you have to have extreme focus. Optionality is the enemy. And one of the challenges with entrepreneurs is that you'll want to you'll be able to create lots, you'll get people excited, you'll create new business deals, you'll create new functionality and opportunities that seem like they're things that can actually take you out of the woods. Like, you're trying to kind of cut through the jungle and the shed to find light. And very often you'll find different paths, and it's good to test some, but the reality is that the more optionality you create on your way out is very often the reason why you become undone. So why is that? Well, you have very finite uh, time and energy and resources to do things. And so it actually takes incredible courage to focus the company down onto what you're uniquely going to do and then follow that. So you have to bet it all, and it takes, it's very hard to let you grow. Third is, 
They all build painkillers and not vitamins. Okay? And this lens is very important because you really have to discover who your customer is, right? Is your customer the restaurant owner and their menu issue that fifteen thousand dollars? Or is it actually you're actually in the marketing business? Are you actually the marketing business for the companies who want to read those restaurants or for the rest of themselves, right? And you know, that lens will actually determine ultimately who is going to create economic oxygen for me. So there's a lot of ways to kind of, you know, they would say that startups don't die and run out of money. So you can either find your way for your company to create economic oxygen, or you can raise a lot of money, right? And raising a lot of money is a lot of work, right? And very often it doesn't come with a lot of answers, it comes with a lot of questions and a lot of pressure. The best thing you can do is to figure out who is in chronic pain. And not just like a cancer-like pain where you have a one-time treatment, but chronic, long-term, inflammatory type of pain, right? That doesn't go away. And that you create something for them that they can never turn off, that they would gouge their eyes out before it so it's the end of their life. And so this is a very, very important lens to think about your business for. Who ultimately are we paying for for and how are we creating economic faster? Number four, you gotta be 10 times better. Not one times, or three times, or five times, but 10 times better. Again, this goes back to the focus and resources and, and, your, and what you get for your money, so to speak. And that is, there's gonna to be tons of optionality for you, what you can actually build, who you can do partnerships with, um, how you create money a lot of times. But it actually, there's only certain things that actually create disruptive, magical outcomes for you and your company. Because if you end up in a feature box, you versus your 10 competitors, you're going to be incrementally better than anybody else. You're going to be one times better. And one times better doesn't make a distinctive mark on a marketplace <coughs> and or lead to the type of outcome you're looking for, whether it be a standalone business or a large exit or something. The only large exit is typically are because you've created and captured something that no one in the world could create other than you, right? And to do that, you have to have something that has that 10x compounding step function type of outcome. And so whatever you do do, that's enable you, right? It's one single focus, it's a painkiller, it must be 10x better to actually have those extraordinary outcomes. And so sometimes what's well, not completely obvious why some companies have exits with a clear order, it's typically because of this factor that that happens. The fifth thing, and the last thing I learned, was that you gotta think like a monopolist from day one. I've sat, I, I do about 10 investments a year, and. Um, and I always am surprised whenever I hear this story. You probably pitched this because I'm guilty of it too, which is like, all we need is like 1% of the marketplace, right? You know this. Um, you can laugh when you said it a bunch of times, right? And you can find your way out. But the reality is that you want to own like 99% of the marketplace, right? You don't want to own 1% of it. You want to win it all. And winning it all means that you think of a monopoly. It also means you understand. What you, how you build your company means that you need to put your organ in a, that, that client, that customer, that person's life, and you start, start rewiring blood vessels through it. Pulling them out and sticking them in you so your organ grows in a way that they can literally never take you out. Because no matter how much they, you, know, you think you create value and they love you, they're going to try to take you out at some point. They're going to try to try something else, even though they're loyal. They may just dislike you or your technology, and they'll try to get rid of you. So the point is that you have to create something that becomes such a vital organ, implicitly and explicitly, based on your own actions and the value you created, that you become a monopolist. And these five things, um, a naked gift, is your company a direct reflection of your unique creation and what you're building? Two, are you truly extreme, an extreme monomaniacal focus on your single big idea? We all hear about pivots, right? And there's tons of interpretations of pivots, but the way I look at a pivot is, is it's really the big idea. It's that target you have on, you know, uh, on the mountainside far away, and you're kind of like a heat-seeking missile, right? A pivot is the, the navigation of the terrestrial challenge you have on the way to that target, okay? That, that one big idea. And you have to do that because the things that you run into could kill you, right? Or you have the opportunity to navigate into you know, safer places or richer opportunities. But once you move the target, that's no longer a pivot, that's a different business. And so as you pick and prosecute your one big idea, yes, you're going to have to pivot. You're actually crazy not to, okay? So don't think of pivot as a bad thing. It's a way, it's the course direction, so you don't run in the mountains all the way to your ultimate target. But ultimately, you have to focus on that one big idea um, to leave that. It must be in some way a pain killer that creates economic oxygen.
Um, you may believe that you're going to create some massive advertising marketplace, and you know all these you know these uh, these opportunities to monetize in the Russian. That's highly unlikely. For Yaffe, you may realize that you're painkillers for the parents. Okay, you're not in the business for advertising. You're not in the business for the school. You're disrupting the fact that guidance counselors suck. Right? <laughs> it's a very complex marketplace, and you're a painkiller for the parent. And as Bloomberg says. The fastest way to success is ask for the check and shut up. And the best place to go for that is the parent, because they want the best for their kids. And they'll subscribe that for their entire four years. It's a huge pain for them. Very, so they dumb it down, simplify it. Build something that creates a drug that's so unruly, ultimately painful to And be 10 times better. You're a long way down the road being 10 times better. And you're likely even to form a monopoly between the school and the students, right? But if you don't know who your painkiller for, it doesn't work. Or if you're overthinking it, I don't think that thing needs to be more than three. I think it should be a 49.99 month problem, right? Fewer customers, lower cost per acquisition, fewer people buy it, you create economic oxygen. Okay? So that's a simple lens. Transform, it's entirely transform your business. And you, gotta, you can't forget that if you're armed with these things, you bring the future forward into the growth of your company because it reshapes the way you look at the opportunity of finding what you're looking to do. So, I thought I'd take it, so that's, that actually is the entire book. So you don't need to read it. <laughs> uh, but I encourage you to because it's, it's so dense with like wisdom and the philosophy of how these entrepreneurs, and of course like practical like advice. It's just, it's like categorized by sales and investors and hiring and firing. It's just like this, it's just a sick toolkit. Um, um, but I thought I'd share a couple of stories about some entrepreneurs in that. So, do you guys know Jawbone? Do you guys know Jawbone, the other cool product? You know the story, like the Jawbone up, how this is like a total catastrophic failure? Who knows this story, right? So they launched it. So the thing is, like, why would they do that, right? And so long before he, he launched this thing, it, it like fell apart, the app didn't work, and they spent a lot of money, they put in 18 t stores and pull it back. I've known him for a long time, and he basically said, he said, what's what he believes in relative to his customer relationship? One is, is that, I'm in a relationship with my customers as an experience continuum. I may have, an on, I have such closeness within the proximity that even if I fail them, that actually serves the business outcome because our, our bind is even tighter. Um, you can see things like everything is always a prototype, right? That first product failure it makes total sense now, doesn't it? Everything's a beta. Um, keep in mind that these guys have been at this for like 12 years, $140 million, and three, three recaps on the way to DAC for that. These guys are tough as nails. And what they remember is that, I love this one saying, is that these last two, you know, yesterday's home run doesn't win today's game. They celebrate for about 30 seconds and they come on, and they never forget the, blood, the taste of uh, blood and dirt now, because that really is the event for experience they have to preserve. Um, Chris Anderson's been our TED. He, uh, I've been going about nine years now. He and Jack are good friends. have been following what they've been doing for many years. And Chris is, Obviously, has a huge intellect, but he's also equally an incredible businessman, right? He'd already built and sold the company for six hundred million before. He took many years off and bought Ted for about six million bucks and grew to way over hundred million dollars in five, six, seven years later. And what he recognized, and this may be part of the way you think about your marketing, right, is that you know passions are a proxy for potential, right? What is it about the passions of your product that you can engage audiences of their interest and in, in promote and create upward spirals? This is the virality story before there was a virality story. This is all those sort of things. Um, I have to like cosmology and you know, physics and those sort of things. I have a walnut-sized brain, but I still listen to like you know Neil Turk and Brian Green and, and, and spend time you know 18 minutes, which is a short attention span of theater for like these grand ideas. And I'm probably like 50 other million million people who watch here are totally fascinated by that. Our retention rate is small, but we like that's kind of infotainment in a lot of ways. And, if you collected tons of those stories and you win a story war, suddenly you could build a massive media company on people's passions. This also could be related to your, uh, your, your own customer service efforts. It could be ways to engage audiences. But remember that Chris is one of the pioneers behind this, and that is why Ted is now a global brand. Because of a few underpins of that, and that's really his, that is his playbook. Those are the four things he believes on the stage. Um, Reed, who wrote the four of the book, is a, a buddy. Um, Phenomenal human being uh, on many levels, uh, part of the PayPal Mafia. And um, I met him about uh, seven, eight years ago through Peter Thiel as the last investor. And he's just, uh, he's one of the greatest connectors of yours in the valley today. He's also incredibly smart, right? So 
But he's, he's, the hardest thing to do is make something simple. So just think about what he says relative to the five things we learned. You know, radically differentiate, execute your biggest idea, you know, create patience, right? LinkedIn, the discipline, what about discipline of an idea? Okay, so they read and Mark Pincus went and bought Sister Dupat, which was the social network that week. Brought it out to Peter and the team. They invested in like six startups, Yammer, um, uh, Slide, which you know, went sideways. Uh, LinkedIn, uh, Peter went out and looked at 20 different social networks before they found Mark said they were going to invest in the 500 grand. They did that for a strategic reason because they believed in something. They were very patient. So we'd start out before Facebook. They were in lockstep, 1 million, 2 million, 5 million, 10 million. And that was the time they decided to put pictures in the news feed. Okay? And Facebook were a period of nine months later from 10 to 100 million users. It just went, it just jacked and never stopped. Whereas LinkedIn just stayed <coughs> plodding along, same course. And so why did, why did Reed not just ape that growth and say, you know, we'll do the same thing? Because when he ultimately wanted to win, he believed that vision was so much more important than, than a social side of personal life, is that we're going to be the professional social network. And the way we're going to monetize that is the same way we monetize it today. And that was like seven, six, seven years ago. And I believe personally long term is that uh, LinkedIn will potentially and might likely be more valuable than Facebook over the next 15, 20 years. So the point is, is that create patience and stick to your focus. Even when, you know, the, don't, don't suffer the city comparison and watch your comparison. You build your company that's innately you. And this is one of the best stories about this because you need to have a long term read into what your innately gives you to do. Elon, um, you guys all know Elon. He's probably, I think he's probably the greatest living entrepreneur today. Uh, next to Jeff Bezos, arguably. Um, actually, he, this part of shoe, domestically speaking, I'm sure it's an amazing investment in the world. I've been a judge for the last like six years at the E and Y contest in New York. It's so incredible how many unique businesses are. We're just one sector of technology, right? But there's there's thousands of other businesses that pale, you know, big technology small by comparison. You got to keep that in mind. You know, it's a hot space and sexy, but it's also as high risk as anything else. There's a lot of other ways to Build companies and be entrepreneurially successful. One of which is trying to get to Mars, right? Um, you know, three years ago, he was one of his best friends with my very very close friends, and Dale Ressi. And uh, three years ago, he was like when I used to go to the Valley, he used to you know stay over at Dale's house or you know stay there. And Elon would be sleeping on the couch. Five kids, fought four hundred million that he had made by three two, bet it all, everything, every dollar, down to zero before those things came back. And there were many times when I was lost the last couple of years. And he was totally cool with it. So it was never about the money. It's never about those sort of things. It's really about what you're made to do. What I'd like to just share with you is this number three rule here, which was very helpful to me, which is the job of CEO, they say, according to Fred Olson, is, is to create a great vision, right? Hire great talent, and never run out of money. If you do those three things, you've done your job. <laughs> The problem is it's not entirely true because there are so many other aspects to what you need to do, which is like stay in the shop floor with your sleeves rolled up 60% of your time, right? Which is what he's saying here, which is never engage in wishful thinking. The problem with entrepreneurs is that we're pathologically optimistic, right? And we think we've done our job. We have it all set up and we've done all the things our VCs have said and we've sort of backed them off because we've hired the talent, but our level of like engagement goes down and the risk of losing the business and you cross your fingers, right? I've done my job. The truth is that can never be the case. You have to trust and verify you are all in so that this threat doesn't you know, invade the company. You really, once you start crossing your fingers, you're, you're in a, a big trouble. Um, next slide is, a, is, a Jay, uh, is actually Steve Lane. Who has read the Four Steps of Epiphany? That's it? How many entrepreneurs are there today who just, <laughs> just, just quit their job? I mean, I honestly got to think you should stop what you're doing like tonight and go buy that book and read it cover to cover before you make another business decision. And I'm, I'm dead serious. I've read about, I don't know, eight, ten times. Anybody who's worth their salt of the it's the Bible of the man. If you write down anything tonight, write down a title of the book, go buy it, it's self printed. It's called the startup, like, I think it's like the startup uh, manual or something now. Yeah. But his original one, which is the paperback one he tried to start Stanford. You have to go get that and read that because it's going to change the way you understand and think about your, think about your business. What was the other one? This is the four steps of the epiphany. 
The reason why is because you're actually going to understand for the first time what type of marketplace you're, you're building. Are you segmenting a new marketplace? Are you segmenting an existing marketplace? Are you net new product? Or are you something that's an um, um, improvement? And there's all sorts of different strategies that go into those buckets and how you actually can grow out of those things. So if you, they're actually roadmaps out of the woods. And wouldn't you like to know how you get out of the woods when you're addressing those dips? That's difficult. It tells you that. Again, innate, right? You can learn this. That's why you need to read this stuff and tool up, right? And the last thing is, and this is the pr profound advice he has, which is, and I think this is why you need to have a, a, a playbook that you believe in, is because success of your company is in this order. First, you need to convince yourself it's true, then your team, and then the marketplace, in that order. And the marketplace will only reward companies that have that word to be true. And so you yourself, if you don't have a playbook, the prisms by which you're betting your life on, and you are not certain that those things are true, a Nate, painkillers, that are 10x better, that are monopolistic, those things, if they're not true, they will not entangle themselves in the spirit of the team, because they will not believe it, and the marketplace will believe you will reward you for that. In that order, you, your, your team, and the marketplace. And so it's great to be excited, but if you're really wishfully thinking about the outcome of company, you need to really study and understand what the company's purpose is and how it's moving the marketplace, and that's the order. And very often, if those things, that axle is broken, that's one of the central problems that tells you maybe I have to rethink what this is about. Tony, um, actually, Tony, this is, a, this is an executive uh, hoodie. <laughs> and uh, this is like a super 150 or something. Um, it's like, because I, I turned 40, so I like, have the adult hoodie. <laughs> I never wear that, but this is like, I just got this at 10 from him, so I had to like, put it on. He wears it all the time, very funny. Um, and it's very simple. He's a wonderful, humble guy. He's, you know, he's also fairly bright, very direct. Humility is, doesn't necessarily mean looking correct. Um, you know, it says for itself, you know, one is always. Um, be committed to the revenue curve that's coming at you. And so it takes about three years to kind of understand your business. So you can actually create enough economic oxygen so you don't die, so that you know enough to see the revenue curve that comes at you that might be the building opportunity, if it comes. And that's what he's kind of saying, is always be willing to radically change, because you're learning as time goes on, and your ability to recognize the real opportunity of your business should reveal itself if it exists, right? And that ha that's part of the game. Is Get the oxygen to be able to have enough time and energy and psychological space to discover really what business you're in and really where the big revenue curve is. And that's part of your job. Not just find one and write it out, but find one that keeps you alive long enough so you actually know enough to recognize when it shows up. And be able to switch the company fast enough with enough agility to actually capture those momentum moments. Jay Walker is the last one. So, Jay Walker is kind of like Thomas Edison. Who knows Jay Walker? Here? No one? So Jay Walker, Google him, is, he has like four, he's one of, I think he's like, maybe like the largest portfolio of an adventure that's limited today, four or five hundred personal patents. He has like, as you live, he has a, um, a office that's like a UFO in Stanford, Connecticut, of all these, you know, beautiful mind PhDs who basically pursue his ideas. <laughs> and it's crazy. And you have been there a lot. It's just like the most wild, you know, collection of artifacts and ideas and patents and a, a portfolio of human shit, possibly something. What I love about Jay, it's very thoughtful, and he always talks about the American entrepreneurs who are all about progress. You know, we, we want to move the ball forward and, and uh, you know, we, no matter where we're going, whether we sideline to sideline, we celebrate the struggle and, and the, the all money we fold and, and the effort. And reality, he's saying, is like, that's sort of like a ready, fire, aim philosophy of work. And his belief is that you have so few shots you can take on goal as an entrepreneur with limited time resources. And they're all kind of live die trees, I'll explain it. You better aim, aim, ready, fire. Okay? Really, really be careful about the shots you pull. Yes, you have to pull the trigger. Yes, you need to do it quickly. But the ones that you fire, you better be, you can't guess. I mean, you have just a couple of bullets, and they got to really move you forward. They can't, you can't afford to go side to side. You must move the company forward. So he says, be thoughtful with this. Recognize that the complexity of all things is not your product. The reality is that your product is important, but it's not the reason why you're going to die as a company very often. It's typically all the other things. And those, all those other things really are about people. Right? You can 
screw up a lot of things, but the thing you cannot screw up is talent. Talent is fatal. One wrong hire in the beginning can screw your whole company up permanently, forever. Unrecover. You don't even time to recover. By the time you get in there, you have it there, they've messed up a few things. It's six months, it's a year, and you're starting over. And there is no starting over in a startup. Okay? I mean, we've all made these mistakes, but you have very few to come back from. And this I love too is talk to people close to your product and far away. Have tensile strength. If you're in the data business, it should make sense to someone in the sciences as it does someone who's a librarian, right? It's not necessarily your, your, your grandmother is your expert, but it can be in an industry that needs to make sense across you know, oceans. And that's a great test for your idea. You want to talk about vision. This is Jay's library. This is the largest personal library in the US. You've never seen it. It's been there a couple times. It's astonishing, OK? It's a $100 million library. It's suspended behind the floor that he works out of. Okay, this is a wing of his house. Okay, about 25 square feet, three floors, and he collects things and he invents them. He has little think tanks that he invents and they go back and they invent and they sell it and they market it and generate some of the money for the next life. And he has to collect things. He likes to collect things like Sputnik, like, <laughs> like a real Sputnik, <laughs> you know, no joke, or Enigma or the Gutenberg model. He's things that like there's one in the world of. And the point is that he. He has the ability to use things because he's risked his whole life and his life's work to have extraordinary, unique, disruptive outcomes and how he lives and this. But this is one of his dreams. And so I set it out there because you're going to have your own things that you're going to dream for the old way you're going to manifest this. And it could be this, or it could be your kids going to college, your lake house, whatever it is. The point is that like, this is how expressed that this is the benefits of the focus and the innate gifts that comes out of these things. Okay, so. I want to show you the last couple of points because these are very simple graphics. Um, I, there's a ton of lessons here. I'm just going to pull a couple down because um, these are other tools for you to think about as you build your own startup. So first thing is, is that the dips, okay? Part of the job of the CEO is to narrate the future, what come, where, where we are in our growth. And I love the concept of dips in Brett Sefko in the book, The Dip. It's the struggle. What, what, where are we in our story as a company? Describing people. This is the moment we launched the company and now we need to deal with scalability or security or, or pricing or um, some customer support. Or whatever those things are, there's going to be these dips that are defining moments. And you and your team need to understand the one or zero focus of the company. And I love the dips as a story to describe your team, where we are today. What's the next dip coming after this? After we solve scalability, it's going to be you know, whatever, user engagement. After you look at the engagement work, what's coming next? You can really actually predict these things. And if you don't know them, you should have counsel of people around you who are going to tell you the order in which they're going to happen. Because your team needs to know what's coming next. This story and the descriptor is a great way to do that, too. You should not be surprised by that. Ben Horowitz always says, and he was using the book as well, that you should never, as a CEO, if something is coming through the organization, like your teams, whether you have two people or 200, 500, you should not be surprised at all. Like almost, you should have almost zero surprise factor. And if it is, you're not doing your job. Literally, that is the, that is the demand. So if you don't have the tools, you don't have the operational controls, or you don't have the people, where as knowledge and events are coming through, if somebody pops out of nowhere, you're like, how did that happen? It's your fault. You own it. Your job is to have systems in place where those things happen. This is a simple thing, the dietary, remember that shot sign goal I was talking about? It's always shocking if you look at the pure data. I asked about 180 people, and um, um, last one for that was about 40 or 500 people fled. What I was always surprised that any part of our growth was that you actually make bets in your deployment of capital, time, resources that take a very, very long time to discover whether they're right or wrong, right? So actually, data takes like 90 days, six months before you're like, was that a good decision or a bad decision, right? Should we launch that feature set with that development code or, or change our pricing or change our funnel or hire that person? Because it's going to take you probably six months to know if that decision was right or wrong. And very often, if they're wrong, you're dead, literally. You'll be in a round of financing and your product engagement number is flat, right? Or you hire the wrong person, they do an interview with your investor and they think they're an idiot, right? All the stuff plays out. The point is that just your decisions in the beginning are incredibly critical, right? You don't need to be perfect, but you have to do things that the big ones really well. Next slide. This is like the custom MVP model that they about product. 
love and peace is. This is the whole Eric Lean gospel. Cut them back. Let your distribution data speak. Data is great engagement. Think about distribution. You know, distribution really is the central problem in your startup. Not always engagement. It's actually how how am I going to get? Is it Yappy? You want your data coming? Yappy. Yappy. How is that going to get to a million students, cost effectively? Honest to God. Like how how are you going to get customer acquisition so you can tank the company? On a churn rate that parents don't leave, so you're good. What's the a ACV of that? How are you going to get to 50,000 restaurants without dying? I don't know. What are those channel distribution things stop when you're on your own? Like that, dude, that's, that's the problem, right? Distribution. Uh, and when it works, once you have it, you've got to bet the whole business on a couple of these ways out of the woods, right? And your job is to architect an outcome that you actually saw this solve distribution, let the data speak, and go to sell like hell that long. This is a very simple, but deep meaning chart, okay? So the hard line in this is reality, this hard line. It's going to be a market correction, could be about a person, could be about data. It also could be going out, you can flip it as well, right? It could be a market opportunity that's brand new, right? Wow, we thought we were in a search business, we're actually in a social business. I thought I was in the business for, for advertising, I'm in the business for parents, right? I'm in the menu business for SEO and Google and not selling to restaurants, whatever it is, right? That hard line is reality. The dash line is incremental decision making. Oh, I'll wait to see, I'll test it, et cetera, right? The dash line here is the decisions that are incredibly courageous, the bet the company decisions, because you know it. I am going to fire that person, right? Because they're hurting my company, even though it's hard, even though my spidey sense it is. Because what happens is if you do this slowly, what is this here? It's the future. It's time and money. You literally, you can think about the density of that, right? As a simple way to say, it's like, if you can't lead a company and make those decisions, the star you have to death die, the star we're gonna the company decision the first time, right? You steal the future. And your people are betting their careers and life on you to make these decisions. So if you have someone on your team today that's doing more harm than good, tomorrow morning, you get up and you fire them. And I mean that, without question. Because you're better off getting that person out of your company and getting it right and indexing against reality even if you slow down because you're stealing the future. And there's like a hundred decisions, but the point is that you gotta be courageous because when you're not courageous, you're incrementally and you're, uh, I think, you know, cowardly, you're gonna kill yourself just on that one ambient decision-making skill alone. Only well, a couple more of these things, so I don't overwhelm you but. Write this down. There's a paper called Eager Sellers and Stony Buyers, 2006 in Harvard Business Review. And it describes market friction. So what it means is that in the marketplace there's an incumbent and there's a competitor. And where you are is here. You're, you're the future, right? This could be Thai versus Cheer, BMW versus Mercedes, Google versus Yahoo. It doesn't really matter. The point is like you're on the small end of an incumbent in your marketplace. And so the question is, is like, how do I get a dollar or a minute of time out of my competitor and move that to me, right? Well, it turns out there's a lot of statistical friction that behavior change, okay? The first thing is there's a natural free hurdle you have to get over, and it's three things. The first thing is ROI. I have to show better ROI versus my, 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 my competitor, my company versus me, how they're currently doing things. Number two, I have to be utterly unique, uniqueness. Otherwise, if you get better ROI, you're not unique, you wouldn't switch, right? And the third thing is, is volume. It's fine if I have a dollar or a minute of your time, but what, what happens when I want all of your money? Right? All of it. You've got to solve the volume problem. It's why Yahoo and uh, uh, Bing merged to compete with Google. They bring all the keyword volume together to get enough marketplace to move dollars across. You can't just have one part of the MSL, MLS listings of real estate. You need all the listings. Because I'm never going to get someone to move all their money unless I have a whole product, okay? And the question is, ROI, uniqueness, and volume. Do I have those three things in the place that I can move from a dollar to his life to the billion dollar mark? That's that 99% marketplace. But guess what? There's actually another factor, which is compounding. So after you build your great product and people are paying a little bit of money and there's, it's unique and you're getting volume, and you think, you're like, how come I'm not, people are not beating the doors down for my company? I've killed myself, I have the best product, everyone says it, but there's not enough customers coming. Why is that? It's because the second factor is user behavior, and it's a catastrophic compounding hurdle. 
And the point is that once someone knows how to use something, they almost never statistically switch. So even if you're better ROI, you're utterly unique, and you've been through all the volume, and you're still surprised that people won't come and use your product and stay with you, it's because people hate behavior change, right? So part of your challenge in distribution and this marketplace is behavior change. How do I get behavior change? Because that is really the problem. This is the being of the business, the rest is this part. And you can solve it in three ways. One is simplicity, right? My product is just simpler. It's the apple versus the blackberry. It's a function of design as well as utility. So how did, how did the iPhone destroy blackberry from 50 billion to five in like seven years? You would never believe that seven years ago, we told you. And they did it because they went and found the linchpin of the business. And so your job to do is find the linchpin, okay? Design, functional linchpin. And what they figured out is that data import was the way that BlackBerry was destroyed. And what did they do? They took 70, 80 engineers, and they figured out how to simply have someone's username and password completely activate their data and switch it to the iPhone. It's just lines of code. About 100,000 can just maintain with 75, 80 engineers, it's 24 hours a day. Because if you have to activate your Samsung, your Blackberry, you have to enter in what? Your SSL, your SMTP settings, your port settings, it's high friction. But on those phones, you never want to switch again once it starts working, right? But Apple, just by brute force, figured out how to solve the problem so it's magical, right? It just works. Your product just needs to work, even if that magical part is just lines of code. Because you know, if I don't solve the linchpin, the business won't work. And that's really important to recognize, what do I need to do to make this marketplace work my favor? There's a second factor there, which is making this part 10x better. That's the second part. And the third part is services. Sometimes it's just easier to pick someone up and move them to you. Services can be cost per acquisition. I love services. Because it does, just don't make me think. Just do it for me. And don't be afraid of that, because the reality is it creates economic oxygen, you learn the business, and it moves things. Almost done, I swear. Remember those curves, that courage? This curve takes typically three years, because you've got to learn the business, you need your glad well, only 10,000 hours, and you learn how to create economic oxygen, because you're going to die otherwise. You'll be raised money, 